Welcome to the Literature Science Alliance. I'm Angela, and this is here holding the memory police is Ryan. And <laughs> oh, hey, didn't see you there. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, we're going to talk about the memory police because we actually both read this in the last month. Yeah, about. About last month. And so the first part of this is going to be spoiler free review style. And then we're going to get into a chatty, spoilery discussion because we actually haven't talked that much in depth to each other yet purposefully for this video. It could be really bad, but <laughs> we will see. So, in general, for those who don't know, The Memory Police is a dystopian story written by the Japanese author Yoko Ogawa. It was actually originally written in 1994 and was translated very recently, I think. 2019? 2019 it came out. So, this is like super new and it's about the epidemic of forgetting on this island. So, you have these people that go through their lives and they'll wake up one morning and suddenly the physical bird and the concept of a bird is disappearing from their society. And it's just that happens with multiple objects, both tangible and kind of even concepts. And it's about following this unnamed narrator, like she's an author, but we never get her name going through this world. So that's the premise of the book. And when he ordered it, I was like, that sounds really cool. <laughs> so I picked it up. I was just doing my, my random internet searching for book ideas and, uh, I think it was the AV Club did a best of uh, year end best of list and had this on for their 2019 list. And I just like read a brief description and I was like, okay, good enough for me. Yeah. So I guess just to start it off, did you like it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You just... Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> well, I guess my answer is a little bit more different. Like, I did like it, but uh, I, I didn't love it, I guess. Well, I guess to actually, like, expand a little bit more on, <laughs> on, on what I felt about it is it took me longer to really soak in what this book had to say than uh, when I initially finished it. Because when I, uh, you were with me when I finished it. Yep. And I was just like, it was just like, this space intentionally left blank for emotions on how I felt on that. Yeah, no, you definitely were unsure of your feelings immediately after finishing it, which I think helped me not be as surprised with how it ended. Yeah. And I think I've, I've talked about that on my vlogs here, about how I responded to the ending. But no, I mean, and this kind of comes into why you and I read dystopians. So, like, when I read a dystopian, I kind of know what I'm getting. So when I picked this up, you also don't have to keep holding it if you don't want to. <laughs> All right. But when I picked this up, I was expecting something more like modern day Fahrenheit 451 or 1984. And I did get that, but it was somehow also <laughs> less tense in some ways compared to those stories. Like those stories had this authoritarian regime that was really made it very full of tension versus this had its own different subtle tension that if you thought about it for long enough, it's really creepy. But I never felt that in the pacing of the story. It was a very meandering, slow narrative. Which just made it sometimes that I wasn't, like, drawn to pick it up or keep reading it. See, I, I thought this was actually a pretty fast-paced book. Okay. But, um, I mean, maybe that's just because it's so short. It's only about 250 pages. And in the same way, I look for certain things in a dystopian book, but I don't... I, I kind of realized after a few days had gone by that this book is more about, uh, just the ride it takes you along than where it ends up. Yeah. No, I totally see that. And that's why I'm glad you're here so you can talk about why you really liked it. Because I do think it left a bigger impact on you than it did me. Not that I regret reading it. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, um, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I, gu I guess to give my, my, you know, if, if this author ever wants a quote from me, uh, <laughs> on the back of the book, um, Blurred. I spent longer thinking about this book than I did reading it, which I think is the highest compliment I can give it. So, also just, you know, going more into the stories, um, what was, what were your standout characters for you without going into why, you know, no spoilers, but, you know, what did you like or not like about the characters we have in this story? And obviously our, our main character is unnamed, but she's a novelist. <laughs> to me, this book is not very character driven. 
Um, to me, this is just... It's one of those dystopian books that gets smaller as time goes by. Um, to the point where it's just pinpointing little moments happening on the island. That's having things being taken away from them. So... Yes, there are, you do follow, like, a set of people in this book, but, like, it, it, they just felt so interchangeable. Like, this could have been any couple of characters. Huh, I would say that this had the stronger characters for me than most dystopians I read. Because I do think a lot of dystopians, the characters are, like, they are meant to be a message or a metaphor. They are less people than they are, you know, an analogy or whatever the word is, an allegory or whatever. And I just felt like, even though we never got a name for the novelist, I really understood her. And I also, so there's a few other, there's like three main characters. You have, I don't even know if we get his name, but there's the old man. Yeah, I think he's just called the old man. We have the old man. <laughs> we have our unnamed narrator. And then we have a character named R. And that's, I'm sure his name is not just R, but that's his name. Yeah. And um, what's interesting about this cast is, I don't know, I feel like, I, I don't know. They, I think part of it is that identity is so hard in this world where you're losing your memories. Like, you know, if this is a society that has their memories being lost, so having your identity very clung to you is just... I feel like that's hard. And I think that's part of how it's explored, which is... I don't know. I guess you're right. It's not character-driven, but I just felt like these characters were more vibrant for me than, say... I gosh, I can't even... I, I vaguely remember the characters from Fahrenheit 451, but I read that last summer, maybe two summers ago. Like, if there's just, like, one character in that one, right? I feel like there's more, but... I mean, there's one central and, like, a few supporting, yeah. Yeah. So I guess the characters for me were one of the strong points of the book, at least in terms of how they were used and how I related to them. But I guess you're right. It's not very character-driven, but it's also not very plot-driven, which is why I felt like I had a rough time with this story. It's... It's happening, and you're just observing it. Does that make sense? It's not a typical narrative structure. Which is, <laughs> you know, a pretty good parallel to what's happening to the characters in the book. Yeah. No, it's fairly true. So I guess, before we dive into more in-depth spoiler thoughts, what's your official recommendation? Read this book. <laughs> All right. No. Um, <laughs> so I... Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would recommend this book um, if you are in the mood for, I guess if you're in the mood for, for a dystopian book, um, I feel like this can kind of slot into anything in that itch you want to scratch, but... Um, I, I would say I recommend it, but I think you should definitely go into it knowing that it's not a traditional narrative structure, that it's not going to... I don't know, that it's not going to have traditional tensions to it. That's true. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, it's going to be a unique experience, but also remind you of experiences you've had with other dystopians, but you're not going to get what you get from those, and that can either work for you or against you, right? Yeah, this one, this one takes some soaking <laughs> in once yeah. you're done, based on just my personal experience, like, with other, like, similar length dystopian books. Usually I don't think too much about them afterwards it's like well yeah that's that's the ending and that all that all tracks whereas this one well this 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 book is just yeah it's a it's far more thought-provoking than i had anticipated and it's extremely timeless like to think that yoko wrote this in 1994 and it's 2020 and it's yeah, very it applicable up. to today it, it's very timeless in its themes so yeah, now we are going to go into spoiler, chatty, discussion stuff. So if you don't care, you can stay. If you've read the book, please stay so that you can tell us if we're wrong or right in the description, like in the comments, because we are not experts, but we're about to have some fun discussing our theories here. So yeah. So I guess the first thing I want to talk about is what did you think of these disappearances and how inexact this system is? Like that was my main gripe. <laughs> that was my main gripe when I first finished it. Because um, I, I spent the entirety of uh, my time reading thinking that we were going to get an explanation as to why things are vanishing and what the motives of the memory police are and how exactly they trigger the mental response for someone to forget what things 
are that are disappearing, and you don't get any of that. It's just kind of hand waved. Oh, yeah, even how things are disappeared, like, it's not even like it's the same method each time. Hmm. And it's weird how the island is somehow, like, in cahoots. Like, it doesn't feel like humans are involved at some point because how could birds just be gone? Yeah. <laughs> you know? How can suddenly there be no seasons? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I guess that could be climate change or something, but, you know, there's just some things that disappear or happen that you feel like there can't be an external factor, like when they lose their limbs. Well, to even even to back it up a little bit, so in, in the timeline of the book, birds are, I think, the first thing that they mention being disappeared on. That the... we experience with the characters. Yeah. And then the next thing is, like, hats. I feel like we were referring to that in the past. Okay, but there, there was a material... Okay, books. Books go away. That's true. Um, and so people have to join in and burn their books. And I didn't understand, like, wait a minute. So the... the but books are... Books have to be gotten rid of, and then you forget it? It just... I, I just didn't understand how the memory police actually policed memories yeah when i was reading this one paper that was talking about were the memory police us sort of thing well so one thing i thought of when um when one thing i thought of when i uh was reading this is because this this is a, a japanese author i thought maybe like the memory police were kind of a metaphor for like a tsunami or a natural disaster um well, but I mean, there is a tsunami in this book that takes out the uh, the old man's boat, so I guess it really. And that was an interesting scene because she doesn't remember what a tsunami is, but yeah. he does, and he the old man is someone who loses his memory, so he's not supposed to remember things that are forgotten. Yeah. And it's implied that tsunamis are forgotten, but he in that moment it's. Really yeah. Interesting. So there's 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 a thought that so one thing that the memory police do is that they're thing whatever mechanism they use to erase people's memory doesn't work on everybody so they're trying to round up and find people who are remembering things and R is one of those people so the narrator and the old man hide him yeah no and it's really it's i like that the memories so it's when you the memories are lost it's not just a hat or a bird it's everything associated with it the memories are associative so, like, that's why when the boats went away, you forget about things of the sea. Yeah. Because when you think of a boat, you think of the sea. You think of problems at sea, like a tsunami. When the birds are gone, you forget about flight, which maybe makes you forget about freedom. Because, you know, it's, it's a very associative loss. And I think it's ambiguity and inexactness can make this story really great, especially when you think about it longer. But it is very frustrating, I can see from your point of view, going into it wanting that concrete answer. Yeah. Like, who is the bad guy? And there is no bad guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's like, just... And, like, it took my brain a little bit to realize the point of the book wasn't to find out, like, who the villain is. Which, you know, is the point of other, like, well-known dystopian books. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that took... That took a, a, my brain a little bit of work to do. Well, I think that was it was misleading on purpose. I think when they're trying to market this book in the U.S., they want it to be Orwellian. They want it to be marketed as 1984 because that's what sells. And, yeah. you I mean, this is written in, in Eastern culture. It's not necessarily meant to be against... It's not supposed to be maybe overtly political like that. Right. You know? And, like, even the inner sleeve says, like, a haunting Orwellian novel. Yeah, and I mean, it does feel Orwellian in some ways, and that Orwellian, you have these characters having these internal struggles, which kind of comes from, we haven't talked about it yet, but there's this story within the story that really is, I feel like, the narrator handling her own issues with this world. And so that is part of Orwellian, because, I'm not to spoil 1984, but in 1984 you definitely have a character handling his inner thoughts a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah, the main character doesn't see 1985. Yeah, well, he does. Well. Anyways, kinda. we're not here for 1984, but it's still, it's like when you have a person processing this world and you get to be so close to them, that's mm -hmm. definitely happening here. Yeah. Yeah, so the story within a story is, um, you know, the narrator's a novelist. Um, R is her editor. Yep. Um, and maybe love interest. <laughs> uh, and so 
the last book that she writes is about um, a woman taking typewriting lesson. Typewriter typewriting. Yeah, typewriting like old typist lessons. Typist, yeah, like. Uh, and the teacher becomes her um, boyfriend, love interest, lover, whatever. They move in together for a while, and then she starts losing her voice, um, and so she can only communicate by typewriter. But then he locks her in a clock in a, tower. In a clock tower. Um, with a bunch of other typewriters. So it's... It was weird, because I think she even mentions in the book that it started off as one type of story. It was supposed to be a love story, where she loses her voice, but there's this man who helps her learn to type, and so she can still communicate. And then it becomes this whole, he's the villain. He steals voices. He steals your essence. And it's very gross. (laughs) Um, And at first, because a lot of the stories being written as they're hiding R away... R is the one in confinement. So you wonder, well, is she the bad guy all of a sudden? But she's also the one losing her memory, which I feel is the voice. Yeah. And it's just... And then novels get disappeared, so she forgets how to write novels, and she spends the last portions of her life, essentially, I want to say life, yeah. like, based off the ending, finishing this book. And I think that Story Within a Story was both my favorite and least favorite part, because I liked it once I was in it, but I hated when I was getting pulled from the story I was invested into into this whole different thing. Because, you know what I'm saying? It was so much really abrupt. That was the point of the story in the story, is just to have it be a... basically explain what's going on, like, through the novelist's own vision. Yeah, but no, I, I really... At least that's how I interpreted it. Yeah. No, I just thought that was interesting. Also, something I thought of while you were talking about the typewriter. This came out in 94. I was thinking it was so archaic that it was a typewriter. And then I remembered my grandmother had typewriters in the early 90s that she gave me to work with. So although, like, keyboards were around, computers were around, it could still be super normal, not old, to be writing on a typewriter. Yeah. You know, like, it was just an interesting thought I had. Like, I actually did have a typewriter growing up. I mean, I was born in 92, so I'm not actually that old, but (laughs) it was fun. (laughs) So, yeah. Uh, So, what else did you want to talk about? I have still themes and the ending. Look at my notes. Well, also, a really cool note. This cover is brilliant. So, at one point in the book, you lose photos. And so, there is a moment where R's kid is born, and they can't send him a photograph because they are forgotten. But they draw, like, a sketch of him. So, this idea that this... I assume is our main character. It could be anyone, probably. But the fact that part of them is drawn and part of it's a photography. And also there's always this idea of voids in this book and how every time something's forgotten, there's this void. And they're not creative at creating enough new things to fill the void. And our narrator's always really concerned, like, if we don't create more things, what's going to keep getting lost? And we figure out that in the ending. <laughs> yeah. Like, this also alludes to the ending. Yeah. So, for the ending of this book, like Angela mentioned earlier, um, the narrator wakes up one morning and realizes that her leg is gone. It's not actually gone, she just can't feel it or move it or anything. Oh, it was such a weird scene. She's like, what is this tumor attached to my hip? Like, her leg is still there, but she doesn't recognize it as a leg. So, the memory police are just... And the whole town just gets used to not having, like, two legs. Um, and so the memory police are just killing off the people on the island and just slowly taking away body parts. And why did, I just don't understand why the memory police exist. I think that's my biggest thing that I'm still confused about, even after, like, mulling it over. Is it because they thought they needed to control people? Because they couldn't control it, so they could control the people? I think it, I, I, my, my reasoning is that it just, it doesn't matter. That's not what the book's about. The book's about a, a population that all just gets used to loss. Like, it hurts at first, but time eventually helps you forget about it. Yeah, and that was an interesting thing that I was thinking about, how sometimes when you go through loss, deep loss, it's hard to be tangible about it. It's, like, easier to move on. Mm -hmm. You know, like, even now, like, you know, we all think about, man, remember when, like, the seasons made more sense? You know, when winter started in late November and ended in, you know, 
early April and, you know. Now. Remember when you could go to a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, you know, like everything, we're all, I oh gosh. Re- reading this during quarantine was uh, a choice. A choice. <laughs> and um, I don't regret it because I obviously really liked the book. But actually, I think I, I tried to do some research on this myself. Um, obviously, you became uh, a little bit better of a detective. <laughs> But I, uh, I did find one article about how um, someone had also read this recently and felt very, like, they felt like themes here clip, they felt like the themes here hit very close to home. Yeah, just, you know, like, sometimes you can laugh about it, but sometimes it's easier to just forget how things used to be, because then you won't be as sad. Yeah. You know, get, getting used to the new normal is deceptively easier than we all think. And this just put that to that extreme. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, the, the themes of loss, memory, and, like, even creativity. Like, how tied to memory creativity is. Yeah. Like, her mom's the sculptor, and her mom's one of the people who never lose their memories, and she is just still able to create, and within her creation, she stores these artifacts of memories lost. And her, you know, her daughter is still a novelist, and through her creativity, she's trying to reconnect mm-hmm. with herself, even though it's very difficult. I think that's really interesting. There's just so much to unpack, which is why I say I really like it. But I guess, so from an analysis perspective, this is a fabulous book. But maybe from a pure, I'm sitting down to enjoy a read for that, like, eight hours I'm reading it, maybe it's not that enjoyable. Yeah, I wouldn't say if you're looking for a feel-good story, read this. (laughs) Yeah, Um, right. (laughs) This isn't exactly, you know, the easiest read if you're... Granted. If any of these subjects are, are a little too difficult to ingest yeah and like that ending oh that ending was weird that ending got like well so that's where i think to me it connected really well with the story in a story Mm -hmm. because yeah doesn't she just become like a voice at the end and then disappears which is almost i recall correctly yeah in the real story she becomes a voice talks to r real quick while her body's on the bed and then yeah it dissipates yeah and she was in R's room, which was hidden, just like the woman in the tower. Yeah. No, that definitely really connected them. I also thought it was weird that this was affecting the dog. I always expected the dog to get disappeared, but he never did. The dog lost his limbs like everyone else. It was very odd. There's a dog in this book, by the There's way. There's a dog. It doesn't die? Maybe it does? Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, no, but this book was really interesting. I am glad you picked it up, because A, I'm getting a lot of booktube clout, because a lot of my friends have been wanting to read it, and I'm like, oh, I just have this around. <laughs> and it's the Asian readathon, so. <laughs> but I feel like, yeah, it's left a mark on us very similar. We just watched Parasite last night, and we've been, like, doing similar, like, deep dives on the internet into that movie, which is great on Hulu, but beware, it destroyed me. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, same, same... <laughs> Same scene where I, uh, I am thinking a lot about Parasite as opposed to when I watched it. I, so, I it enjoyed just... it both watching it and after Oh, no, I, I loved watching it. It's just, it's the same, um, attitude I have towards Memory Police where I think a lot about it more so than the time it took me to ingest it. Yeah. Well, these are our bookish thoughts about Memory Police. And if you've also read it and have thoughts and want to extrapolate on anything we talked about, please comment. I'll respond. He might read it. He. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's another thing. This is so much prettier, right? Right? Just to have this little emblem. I like naked books. I'm weird. <laughs> but, yeah, that's it. Like if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to. And I'll see you in the next one. You want to say bye? Bye. bye. <laughs> I'll be here. You don't have to say bye. All right. Now hold it up. We have to do a thumbnail. Oh, okay.